Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, we're running a little bit behind time, but we'd like to get started. First of all, could I say that um, I'm Anthony Adair, and I'm deputising tonight for Greg Lindsay, who normally uh, chairs these sorts of events, but uh, Greg has been detained in Sydney. So I've been given the onerous task of uh, introducing our two speakers tonight. The subject of our discussion tonight is faux feminism. There's a very poignant Melbourne tone to this because it's, the subheading is traffic light equality. <laughs> and we all remember what happened in Melbourne on International Women's Day with the traffic lights on the corner of Flinders and Swanson Street. That's by the by. The subject of tonight's discussion is a lot more serious than that. First of all, can I just give you a few housekeeping rules? Uh, each of the speakers will talk for about 20 minutes. At the end of that, there will be ample time for questions. Uh, if you are going to ask, I'll, we'll go through the, the rubric for questions later on. There will be plenty of time, but uh, our principal speaker from Sydney has to get away at a quarter past seven to catch a plane back home to the wet capital of uh, the east coast of Australia. So without any further ado, let's get underway. The first speaker tonight is Kay Heimovitz, who is the visiting scholar at the Centre for Independent Studies in Sydney. But, uh, she's also the William Simon Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor of City Journal. She writes extensively on childhood, family issues, poverty, and cultural change in America. She's written a number of books, all of which you can look up on Google or Amazon and probably buy. She's presented her work at many conferences, but the most interesting thing recently has been the article that she wrote in The Australian about two weeks ago, I think it was. Yeah. Last, last week, weekend, uh, recently. <laughs> I have a copy of it here. Uh, and I commend all of you to go to the Australian website or indeed to Google Kay's name on, uh, on Google and get a copy of it. It's a brilliant piece of writing. So, first speaker tonight, Kay Heimovitz. Um, thank you. Uh, being an American, I'm going to talk a little bit about the scene uh, in America and, and the election, which I have found uh, actually interests Australians almost as much as it does Americans and uh, uh, find a way to weave feminine, the issue of feminism into that. And I think you'll see uh, that I can do that and actually make a very useful uh, um, set of insights about, uh, about what the uh, American scene is and how it led uh, to Trump, because as you know, we endured this amazing earthquake on uh, November 9th. Uh, no one thought Trump would win. Um, in fact, the idea seemed almost ludicrous. And on the evening that we watched the returns, and I, I, when I say we, I mean almost, I, I assume almost the entire country, including Team Trump, watched those returns with our jaws dropping lower and lower and lower. We really couldn't believe it. So the question uh, is, why, why did no one see this coming? Uh, there are a lot of reasons for, for it, of course. Um, there was faulty polling. Uh, we had poor turnout among blacks, and the Clinton team was counting on a lot on a very large black vote. We have a crazy electoral college system, which I won't begin to describe to you. Uh, we had a very unpopular opposition ca candidate, uh, namely Hillary Clinton. Um, and we also had people who were unwilling to, <laughs> unwilling to admit that they were going to cast a vote for a man they knew was crude and perhaps even a little daft. Now, I, um, I've been surprised to see how many Australians um, are, have uh, become interested in the election, but I, I uh, completely understand why. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that caught people by surprise the most was, uh, was the women's vote. Um, and that's what I want to get to right now. Um, in the U.S., uh, many major media outlets have reporters who cover what I think of as the gender beat. They're young, they're, tw they're in their 20s and early 30s, they're college educated, they frequently went to Ivy League or very elite schools. They live in New York, D.C., Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Uh, some have majored in gender studies. Some have uh, simply inhaled the widespread campus ideas about the power of race, gender, and sexual orientation to shape our identity and social reality. 
But their assignment at these uh, media outlets is to cover issues of interest to women, but also to write about uh, recent research on gender, to find a gender perspective on recent news events. They are very active in social media. They speak on college campuses where they, the very ones where they used to study. They sit on panels at bookstores, libraries, arts, and literary events. And I think it's fair to say that they have moved into the role of experts on gender. Uh, that is, they are the experts to explain the social and power relations between the sexes to bring spotlight to inequality. Uh, and that inequality can uh, be in almost any arena. It's the gender gap in STEM, that is, uh, do you use that term, the um, sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The small percentage of women in Congress, gender caps everywhere uh, uh, in every state. There'll be articles on the gender gap in Montana, the gender <laughs> gap in Illinois or Maine. Uh, gender gap in cardiac surgery, museum art directors, painters, sculptors, they're just an endless number of articles you can write uh, if you use that lens uh, to analyze things. Now, when the 2000 elect uh, 2016 election came along, it, it at first seemed like it had been designed by a goddess determined to make reality conform to the gender feminist idea, idea of reality. Um, social media had already let loose a, th a seething crowd of very loudish young men who enjoy nothing, nothing more than taunting girls, and particularly the popular girls on social media. And their tweets and posts uh, of this loud, these loudish young men ranged from the obnoxious to the genuinely threatening, and it seemed to prove the worst about men particularly white men. The election itself, which pitted a hyper-credentialed uh, feminist godmother against an ill-informed sexist vulgarian was the best gift of all. The Hollywood Access tape, which I, uh, I don't know if you know that. Uh, I, I bet you know about the tape. I don't know if that's what you know what it's called. That's the one in which um, Trump can be heard boasting of grabbing women's private parts. And there, afterwards, there were, uh, after it was released, there was a steady march of women who came forward to accuse Trump of actual abuse, not just boasting about, about it. But, and uh, there was enormous disgust, uh, not just uh, among the um, uh, gender feminists, uh, but also even among high-level Republican women. Um, high-level staffers for Republican candidates, um, Republican senators. Uh, there was so much uh, uh, discussion of it that the articles could practically write themselves, and so they did. And you had a slew of titles that came out um, during the uh, uh, summer uh, and early fall. Republican women are done with Trump. Republican women feel betrayed by their party. Uh, those kinds of titles popped up like so many weeds after a thunderstorm. And of course, we know now uh, that they were wrong, um, like really embarrassingly dead wrong, uh, despite a bully of a candidate who saw humiliating their fair sex as a favorite sport. Women did not form the voting places. They made up a mere 1% more of the voting population than they had in 2012 during the last Obama election. Um, that was very different than what was expected. Hillary Clinton uh, uh, had a 12-point advantage among women voters. It was actually not very different than what it had been under Obama, so nobody was or not that many people were very turned on by the idea of coming out for the first woman president. White women actually preferred Trump by 10 points. Uh, and uh, you remember that headline, Republican women are done with Trump? Well, actually, 92% of Republican women voted for him. Uh, here's an interesting fact that you will never, I, I, I haven't seen covered by media. Um, women are actually the most divided of identity groups. We're always talking about uh, uh, the black vote, the Hispanic vote, the, uh, even the, the gay vote. 
Um, and those um, groups actually did vote much more as a unit. Women did not. They are quite divided. Uh, now, if you, you don't call me foolish, but it seems to me when you completely miscall an election, when you were wrong in article after article about what was supposed to happen and something that you were supposed to be so expert in, which is the needs and desires of American women, you would crawl back into your office or cubicle and think long and hard, what did I miss? Have some of my uh, examples or my, some of my assumptions been incomplete or, God forbid, even wrong? Um, there's a wonderful story uh, that I've mentioned uh, in another uh, talk in uh, Australia um, that, I, that I think is useful here. Alan Greenspan is the former head of the Federal Reserve and therefore one of America's uh, most important economists, was grilled by Congress about the causes of the global financial crisis, which I'm always uh, taken aback to hear people here call GFC. We don't, we don't use that term. So he was asked uh, about the causes, uh, and he answered in that very bland way. I don't know if you've ever seen him on television. In that very bland way, he had, there was a flaw in the model. Uh, this is Alan Greenspan being humble in the face of a massive fail. At least he could admit there was a flaw, <laughs> a problem in the model. But I don't think media, uh, the America's media feminists were able to do that. That is, to consider that maybe there was a flaw in their model. And since the election, there have been very few signs of self-reflection. Instead of trying out how to figure out how so many uh, women failed to conform to their version of things, they burrowed deep down into gender theory. So, for instance, one uh, young writer at Vox, which is a very popular website, uh, and who is uh, called there the staff writer on gender, wrote uh, an article, Why Misogyny Won. <laughs> um, another article and another website, uh, important uh, or, or uh, popular website. This is how much America hates women. Uh, um, some, in the same article, the writer said, white women will pawn their humanity for the safety of white supremacy. Uh, instead of trying to understand the women who voted for Trump, they described them as lacking awareness, as having a lot of self-loathing, as being psychologically damaged. The results reveal what was called uh, by a number of different writers, internalized misogyny. That is, the women had actually come to believe that women were inferior, so they were going to uh, vote for uh, somebody who they uh, uh, assumed also thought that. And perhaps the most devastated of the media feminists was not a journalist, but actress and writer, Lena, Lena Dunham, who I assume most of you have heard of, creator of the hit series Girls. Dunham had campaigned heavily for Clinton. She even spoke at the Democratic Convention, which was odd because she knew very little about politics or policy. The Clinton team was very interested, however, in, in mobilizing young women to vote. Uh, to vote. Uh, they, because those young women had early on shown an unexpected affection for Bernie Sanders. So this was one way they had. They reasonably assumed that Dunham would mobilize this demographic. This is what she wrote the day after the election. White women, so unable to see the unity of female identity, so unable to look past their violent privilege, and so inoculated with hate for themselves. It wasn't supposed to go this way, she continued. It was supposed to be her, that is Clinton's job. She worked her whole life for that job. It's her job. Now, when I- uh, Suck it up, Chris. <laughs> really? <laughs> Has not happened yet. Now, when I write and speak about feminism, I notice that a lot of people fall back on a criticism, and I actually saw a comment on Twitter making exactly this point. A, a criticism that goes something like this. Women have rights. They should have the opportunity to use their talents as they want. We're not going back. You know what? I fully agree. Uh, women are due the same political, personal, and economic rights and respect as men. 
almost all Americans, and I suspect Australians as well, believe that. And the few who don't are probably unwilling to say so in public. Uh, this is no longer controversial. Um, and if that's what people like Dunham and the other media feminists I've mentioned had in mind, if that were all that the gender studies professors and activists were educating their students towards, I wouldn't be here right now. If that's what Dunham had in mind, we wouldn't find so few women willing to call themselves feminists. And this is a really important point. It hasn't changed in the years, decades, really, that I've been studying this issue. Um, in the United States, about 37% of women said they consider feminists. That is, I will admit, that is at an all-time high. But it's up from something like 32%. Um, in, uh, in the UK, it's 9% in a recent study. Now, I, I uh, caution here, I don't know how reliable these studies are. So uh, you know, it is possible that more than 9%, and I wouldn't be surprised, more than 9% do call themselves feminists. But you get the idea. Um, a Canadian uh, poll found a similar about a quarter of the population calling themselves feminists. But uh, feminism in the Anglosphere and perhaps much of Europe has evolved into something much more radical and damaging to both uh, women and society as a whole than a mere call for equal rights. It has turned into a, grievous, a grievance service industry whose job is to bring a microscope to social life and pick out any possible sign, no matter how minor, of inequality, uh, which is always assumed to be a result of discrimination. Uh, in the Melbourne now, uh, you have a perfect example in the news, you mentioned it, uh, that male figures on crossing lights. I mean, who, who looked at those lights and thought, we've got to have women represented here, but people do. Uh, that there are so many others. Um, over the years, uh, people have talked a lot about Hillary's hair. And um, I admit that in the early 90s, um, there, there may have been some uh, a, a bad feeling about Hillary as a woman. I don't deny that. Uh, that has changed over time. Um, but uh, she, people still mentioned her hair. <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned, her clothes as well. And um, for many young gender federalists, feminists, this was always a, a headline. It was something to write an article about. So-and-so mentions uh, Hillary's cleavage or something like that. Uh, it shows that the voters are misogynist. But I guarantee that if you could tally up the references to candidates' hair during the campaign, yes. it wouldn't be Hillary's. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think the biggest failing among the gender feminists, and the one that explains their uh, failure to understand what was happening in the lead up to the election, is that their assumption, they had an assumption that women are a single group with, uh, with common, not just common aspirations, but the same aspirations and interests. They, uh, these women have solidarity, as Dunham put it. Now that doesn't mean you mean that they have uh, that the women, uh, the gender feminists, have no interest in women who are unlike them. Uh, like many of us living in multicultural societies, they are uh, very interested in minority groups as they should be. But they have come up with a new theory: um, intersectionality. Is that? Travel to Australia yet? Well, get ready. It's coming. <laughs> intersectionality. I have to read this because it's so complicated. Uh, it refers to the double oppression that comes with being a minority woman. So a black, Hispanic, Asian, Muslim, or gay woman uh, has, uh, suffers from an intersection of, uh, of oppression. Um, now, this intersectionality relies on a limited set of identity categories, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation. But does that really cover the gamut of, uh, of people's identity? Uh, the gender feminists were so preoccupied by gender and race and sexual orientation that they forgot to notice the immense class, education, and geographic divide in their own country. Gender identity politics uses the oppression of women as the organizing principle for interpreting the world 
all issues can be boiled down to this one Manichaean struggle in, this case, in the case of this election between feminism and misogyny. But to understand this election required an entirely different framework. The women who voted for Donald Trump, 53% uh, of the uh, white women, as I mentioned, were mostly not college educated, which means they didn't work as journalists or in the professions or creative industries or in academia. They worked at small businesses or stocking shelves in local supermarkets or maybe uh, as um, waitresses. They lived not in thriving coastal cities with wine bars and tapas restaurants, but in small towns and decaying industrial cities in the heartland. What, which is uh, often condescendingly referred to on the coast as flyover country, meaning <laughs> we try to skip that one, <laughs> fly over it from uh, coast to coast. Uh, but these towns were suffering uh, in the Midwest, in, in the, what's called the Rust Belt in the Midwest, and around the Southeast and in other areas. The United States has become extremely divided by class over the past decades. It's something that I knew before I came here, but being in Australia has really uh, brought it into focus for me, because I don't see quite the same problem here. We have now have an immense cl class divide, mostly based on education. The educated are moving ahead. Uh, they are moving to cities where the good jobs are. They are able to take advantage of the global economy. Uh, meanwhile, the less educated are falling behind where the industrial areas that used to provide a very good living uh, for working class families um, are in decline, as they are in most, uh, in most, in, uh, most uh, uh, advanced countries. But because this was the background for the election, issues like the gender gap the gender pay gap that Hillary talked about quite a bit rang hollow uh, because they were they, what they saw around them was men uh, mostly who had seen their manufacturing jobs vanish. Uh, her veil, her vow for equal pay for equal work, which I don't think any sensible person uh, disagrees with, uh, still was seen as a message for professional women. Uh, not working class voters. One of the reasons for that is that the uh, working class women were actually doing somewhat better than the working class men. So uh, it, didn't, it didn't ring as, a, uh, as an issue that they uh, was going to stir them. What was on their minds was not misogyny, the glass ceiling or sexual harassment, but jobs, terrorism, and their dying communities. They found the gender feminists entitled condescending and smug about their place in the world and their attitude towards people like them. And they didn't listen to them, and the feeling turned out to be mutual. Few of the media feminists spent much time in these places that I've been describing, the industrial, fading industrial areas. And when they did, they could only look at them through the uh, lens of race, gender, and sexual orientation. One typical entry, the working class women were voting for Trump because they were dependent on their husbands and to being told what to do. In other words, they couldn't see uh, what they were, what the, if they went into those communities, what, what was in front of them. So I want to end with this. Uh, just uh, yesterday, I read about a pop-up store in, in Washington. It's called Outrage. Uh, and they sell clothes with, uh, uh, emblazoned with things like nasty women unite. Um, I also noticed a tweet, and it, it, it said that uh, I, I don't, uh, there was a, a lot of uh, talk about the fact that when a Angela Merkel came to the States, Trump, uh, and she did not get along very well for <laughs> obvious reasons, and um, he evidently refused to take, to shake, or to shake her, her hand and to look her in the eye. So um, <clears throat> somebody tweeted, uh, somebody, a popular tweeter, a uh, female tweeter, uh, Trump's refusal to look Ang uh, Angela Merkel in the eye or to shake her hand belies his abject disrespect for women. Today, we are all Angela. Now, I think we can understand why working class women might wonder, what do these women have to be so angry about? Thank you.